Welcome back to Disturbed Reality. Edgar Jimenez Lugo, or better known as El Ponchis, was the first case of a child hitman known and documented in Mexico. Upon his arrest in 2010, the miner confessed that he had cut the throat of four people and that he was in charge of a group of youngsters distributing cocaine in the state of Morelos. Edgar Jimenez Lugo didn't have the best start in life. He was born in San Diego and grew up in a dysfunctional family. He was taken by child protective service workers after testing reportedly found cocaine in Edgar's bloodstream at birth. Both of his parents were addicted to crack cocaine and had frequent brushes with the law. They were also undocumented migrants, which only added to the uncertainty surrounding young Edgar's life. Eventually, as Edgar became an infant, his paternal grandmother on his father's side filed for and was awarded custody of young Edgar. He would subsequently move with her to Mexico in the state of Morelos. Although life wasn't easy, his grandmother enrolled him into a local school and provided what she could for him. He lived in a home crowded with adults, his grandmother, father, an aunt and uncle, as well as his five siblings. Initially, it seemed that Edgar was on the right path. He had an impeccable attendance at school, and was said to be a quick learner and a very good student. However, things would soon change when Edgar's older sister got a new boyfriend named Julio de Jesus Radila Hernandez and introduced him to the family. Julio, on the surface at least, appeared to be a successful well-mannered man who was a catch. Though, as I'm sure you can guess, this wasn't the case. Julio took an interest in Edgar and soon befriended him. He would buy him gifts and treat him as almost a younger sibling, which resulted in Edgar seeing Julio as a role model. The truth was, however, Edgar was being groomed to be recruited into Cartel del Pacifico Sur. Julio, who was better known on the streets as El Negro, was a high-ranking member of the criminal organization. Cartel del Pacifico Sur, or in English, the South Pacific Cartel, was formed in April 2010 by Hector Beltran Leyva after the collapse of the original Beltran Leyva organization. Originally, the Beltran Leyva clan were made up of four brothers, Arturo, Alfredo, Hector, and Carlos. They started their criminal careers by working their way up the Sinaloa cartel to become prominent leaders within the organization, rubbing shoulders with the likes of El Chapo and El Mayo. However, the relationship with Cartel de Sinaloa would eventually turn sour in early 2008, leading the Beltran Leyva brothers to split and subsequently go to war with their old employers. The reason for the split resolves around the capture of El Mochomo, the aunt, Alfredo Beltran Leyva by authorities which occurred on the 20th of January 2008. The capture of Alfredo incensed the remaining brothers, especially Arturo, aka El Jefe de Jefes, or the Boss of Bosses. Fueled on coke and paranoia, he ordered the assassination of the Commissioner of Federal Police, Edgar Eusebio Melan Gomez, and other top federal officials in the Mexican capital. He, Edgar Eusebio, would be shot dead by Beltran Leyva gunmen a few months later. Though, that wasn't enough. Arturo soon suspected that the arrest of his brother Alfredo was a setup, and that none other than El Chapo was responsible. 
The rumour goes that El Chapo gave away Alfredo's location to the police in exchange for one of his son's freedom. The Beltran Leyva brothers would then split from the Sinaloa cartel and wage a bloody war of attempted revenge, which ultimately wouldn't go well for the Beltran Leyva organisation. The war between BLO and the Sinaloa cartel would be especially brutal, with graphic execution videos being uploaded online and public displays of violence with mutilated bodies being left in the streets. El Chapo's own son, Edgar, would be killed as a result of the conflict. He was gunned down outside of a shopping mall in Culiacan. Sicarios ambushed the red SUV in which he was travelling in and fired 500 bullets at the vehicle, killing those inside, including Edgar. Some speculate that Beltran Leva Sicarios were responsible for the murder, though some suspect that the hit was a case of mistaken identity and that Sinaloa cartel gunmen were responsible for the hit as they thought the SUV contained Beltran Leyva members. Whatever the truth is, this would only exasperate the war further. Ultimately, the problem for the Beltran Leyva organisation was that not only were they in constant battle with Sinaloa gunmen, but also law enforcement who the Sinaloa cartel had on side. This would prove to be costly for BLO, as on the 11th of December 2009, Arturo Beltran Leyva, the head of the organisation, would be shot dead by the Mexican Navy's elite special forces units. Arturo, fueled on cocaine and anger, refused to give himself up and go down quietly. Instead, he and his bodyguards engaged with the Navy gunmen resulting in an innocent bystander being killed via a stray bullet. Four Sicarios would also be killed and a further ten being arrested. At the time of Arturo's death, he was one of the most wanted drug lords in Mexico. After the death of Arturo, his brother Carlos was arrested in Culiacan on the 30th of December 2009 after he was stopped while driving with a fake license. With Alfredo and Carlos now in prison, and with Arturo dead, Hector Beltran Leyva was the last man standing. He would go on to create Cartel del Pacifico Sur in April of 2020, though the new organisation would not reach the levels of power of the old BLO cartel. Hector Beltran Leyva would eventually be arrested by the Mexican army on the 1st of October 2014. On the 18th of November 2018, Hector Beltran Leyva began having chest pains. A prison guard reported this to medical personnel who tried to give him first aid attention in his prison cell. As his symptoms worsened, he was then transported to the Adolfo Lopez Mateos Medical Center in Toluca in the state of Mexico. According to the medics, he died of a massive heart attack in the emergency room. Upon his death, the hospital notified authorities and stated that they would conduct an autopsy as required by Mexican law. His family was notified of the death and they claimed the body. The hospital's emergency area was safeguarded by security forces while Beltran Leyva was receiving medical attention. Despite the death of Hector, the South Pacific Cartel do still operate, although they are not considered a major player in today's cartel landscape. But anyway, back to Edgar Jimenez Lugo, aka El Ponchis. Shortly after Julio de Jesus Radila Hernandez was introduced to the family, young Edgar would stop attending school as regularly, often missing days at a time. It became harder for his grandmother to monitor him as she was struck 
with a terminal illness. By age 11, it is believed that El Ponchis was fully integrated into the South Pacific Cartel, and by age 12, he would then drop out of school completely after the death of his grandmother. El Ponchis, along with other youths, were dedicated to distributing cocaine to drug dealers in the state of Morelos. They were essentially drug mules. Though, this wasn't the full extent of El Ponchi's involvement within the cartel. Allegedly, he can also be seen present in two execution videos, though he doesn't participate in the killings on film. Having said that, it is believed that El Ponchi's killed at least four cartel rivals from the age of 11 to 14. In 2010, at age 14, he was arrested on charges of possession of exclusive military weapons and for his involvement in kidnappings, torture, and killings. Due to his age at the time, he was only tried at a state court because Mexico has no system to try minors at the federal level. When he was handed over to prosecutors, the boy calmly said in front of news reporters that he had participated in four killings, while, according to him, drugged and under threat. He stated that he slit the throat of his victims. Under judicial reforms enacted several years ago, Morelos State sets a maximum sentence of three years for offenders aged 12 to 15. Older minors can be sentenced to five years in prison, and those younger than 12 cannot be tried at all. Credited with time served, Edgar was released in December of 2013, when he was around 17 years old. Since he faces no US charges, he was completely free when he returned to the United States upon his release. He was transferred to either San Antonio or San Diego to live with relatives, and supposedly, he still lives in the US. According to the very little information out there, he has not reoffended since his release. It goes without saying, Edgar was absolutely groomed into the world of ruthless criminality. Though, the question still remains, should he have been released? Even if he has truly repented for his actions, it may still be a dangerous precedent to set. Ultimately, public safety also has to be considered in such cases. He was surrounded by violence throughout his formative years, and he knows what it feels like to take a life. Potentially, under certain circumstances, could that level of violence once again be triggered in his adulthood? All I can say is, let's hope not. Let me know how you feel about his release. But nevertheless, let's talk about the actual videos in which he was allegedly involved in. In 2010, two narco execution videos were released online, with many speculating that El Ponchis was present during the killings. During one of the clips, a young boy can be seen sitting in a doorway, watching as the execution takes place. Some speculate that the boy isn't El Ponchis, though many others claim that it is. Regardless, it is disturbing seeing such a young child observe such horror without much reaction. One of the videos is often referred to as Human Piñata or the kiss of death in the online narco community, whereas the other video is one that has been more or less forgotten with time. The first video, Human Piñata or the Kiss of Death, is a longer one at around 6 minutes in length. At the start of the video, a gagged man who is wearing a black t-shirt can be seen hanging from the ceiling by his arms, almost like a piñata. He is being whipped with what looks to be a belt, 
or something similar. As they hit him, his body sways from side to side from the force of the blows. After a few seconds, they then rip off his shirt. A man who is wearing a black ski mask then resumes whipping him, but this time much harder and the sounds of the whip on bare flesh is hard to listen to. After whipping him some more, the man in the ski mask then drops the whip and uses the victim as a boxing heavy bag. He continuously punches him in the body as the person filming laughs. The fuds from the punches echo around the room. At this point, the victim finally begins to let out muffled screams, which only draws more laughter from the Sicarios in the room. The video then appears to jump cut, and it shows the extent of the damage that the victim has suffered. His torso and back are covered in red whip marks and welts. The Sicario then takes what appears to be some sort of metal pole and beats him some more. It appears that the victim may have passed out at this point. Once again, another jump cut and the Sicario with the ski mask can be seen tormenting the victim, whispering in his ear and then kissing him through his ski mask, hence one of the titles, The Kiss of Death. He then takes his phone and films the victim for a few seconds. Multiple men then resume beating the victim, alternating between punching and using metal and wooden poles. At the end of the video, the victim appears to have been beaten to death, and the cameraman takes a close-up shot of the victim's face as the Sicarios can be heard laughing and joking in the background. It is speculated that El Ponchis was one of those in the room. The second video is much shorter, at 2 minutes and 52 seconds long. The room appears to be a similar, if not the same room, to where the first execution was filmed. As you play the clip, a man can be seen with a noose around his neck, with the rope coming from the ceiling. The victim is standing on a bucket so that the rope has some slack. After a short while, one of the Sicarios in the room kicks the bucket, causing the victim to fall, as the noose then breaks his neck. The Sicarios in the room then film the victim's lifeless hanging body on their phones. They laugh and joke as they pose the victim's head in different positions. The video then jump cuts, and it shows the men in the room beating the lifeless body with various objects, such as wooden and metal poles. It's worth noting, at around 30 seconds into the video, a child wearing a striped t-shirt can be seen sitting in a doorway, just staring at the hanging corpse. Many believe this child to be El Ponchis. Nothing is known about the victims in the videos. Both videos are extremely hard to watch. The sadistic nature of the prolonged torture of the first victim in particular is disturbing to say the least, as well as the Sicarios in both videos having fun and laughing as they carry out the acts of barbarism. I certainly wouldn't recommend that you search for these videos. At the time, back in 2010, the case of El Ponchis surprised and shocked many, though the reality is, as the years have passed since then, child involvement in drug cartels has only increased, with many children being recruited for low-level positions such as being a Halcon or a Lookout, though that position still carries much risk, and ultimately, if they were to be captured by a rival cartel, 
well, you know what would happen. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, if you can enjoy this sort of content. Many of you guys have requested this case to be covered, so thank you for the topic. And if anyone else out there has any other topic ideas, please feel free to get in touch. The best place is Twitter. Drop me a DM. The link will be in the pinned comment. Also, if you could check out my Twitch, that would be much appreciated. But anyway, as always, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.